Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, our next uh, version of BGS in Conversation, where we uh, greet former pupils of the school uh, back uh, virtually, albeit, um, to have a chat to uh, somebody who's still here, namely me. Uh, my name is Paul Merckx, I'm one of the assistant heads. Uh, and this evening I'm delighted to have an opportunity to speak to Richard Narurka, uh, who left BGS in 1984. Um, a world-renowned marathon runner, Richard won the World, World Cup title in only his second race at the distance in 1993, subsequently placing fourth, seventh and fifth, respectively, in the European Championships, World Championships and Olympics. Richard still holds the British, the British record for running 10 miles and back in the marathon he achieved his personal best in 1997 in London in a time of two minutes, two hours, <laughs> eight minutes and 36 seconds. Richard describes himself as a late starter by which he means he entered the international running stage after academic success at Oxford and Harvard but his athletic career began with the BGS Cross Country Club under Selby Brock and Tony Kingham. At BGS, Richard also represented the school in rugby, cricket, badminton, swimming and table tennis. So he was kind of busy. A true Renaissance man, Richard is a linguist and former teacher who runs his own sports based travel business, has commentated for the BBC on the London Marathon and is co-founder of the Great Ethiopian Run. Uh, as always, questions are very welcome. Uh, if you can find your way to the chat function in Teams, we'd love to hear from you, um, especially if you were a, a pupil at BGS at the same time as Richard uh, and would like to uh, send him a message. So Richard, welcome. Um, and thank you very much for agreeing to, to talk to us about your time at BGS um, nearly 40 years ago now, uh, and also to share some experiences from your life as an elite athlete and as a businessman. Um, I wonder, uh, can we start with your time at BGS? Uh, obviously, that's where your running career kind of started out. What do you remember of training sessions with Tony Kingham and, of course, Selby Brock, who sadly passed away earlier this year? I guess, uh, well, Paul, thanks very much for, for having me on. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, thanks for also for reminding me that um, I... I represented BGS um, at table tennis and badminton and all those things because I guess we're going to be talking quite a lot about running, which is um, very close to my heart. But um, BGS wasn't just about uh, study and, and cross country running, although it was it was a very big part of my life there. And um, going back to your question, the training sessions, um, I just remember that we we ran a lot. Um, and there were lots of training sessions uh, and there were lots of races and there were lots of shared experiences. And, and let me just explain what I mean by that. Um, most lunch times in every week of the school term from beginning of September until the end of the spring term in March, we would meet as a cross country club and run together. And that was, you know, 40 to 50 of us and um, a smaller group of us would meet uh, after school to do the same thing. That means two training sessions, two running sessions a day. And then of course we'd have races uh, on Saturdays. And then again, we would also train at the weekends, uh, sorry, on Sundays. And so, you know, looking back uh, at my time as a schoolboy, um, and this is true of, of many of us who are in the cross country club, we just did a lot of running. And I think that, a lot of 14, 15, 16 year olds nowadays uh, would not be doing that amount of running. But but the one thing that I would want to tell you and, and that um, I would say to anyone is that no one was forcing us to run. Um, and certainly Selby and Tony weren't. Um, we just did it because we loved it. And we um, we loved being part of the cross country club. And of course, we wanted to be the best uh, school running club in the country um but um so that was also a motivation but um it wasn't because we were you know the best in the country it was because we just loved running that's that's really interesting and of course you you're absolutely right kids kids nowadays wouldn't recognize that kind of training session um i'm not I'd, I'd love to hear in a moment your thoughts on whether that's the right sort of amount of training for young people to do, because I know that the science has come on an awful lot over the years. But you mentioned that you ran because you loved running. Um, 
what was it at schoolboy level that that made running so attractive to so many people? Forty or fifty runners in a club is 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 just fantastic. I mean, schools nowadays struggle to get cross country st uh, teams together. If I'm absolutely honest, but we're, we're very lucky here that we have a, a very talented squad of runners at the moment that we can draw from. Um, but but what was it? Was it was it was it Tony and uh, and Selby? Was it just the joy of running? Was it the fact that near BGS we have some lovely woodland that you can run in? Are you able to tell us what was it that made running so attractive to so many people back in those days? Yeah, well, well let me let me start by talking about Tony and Selby because I think Tony and Selby were the main reason uh, that they they were the the main reason why. Um, why I developed a love for running. They they were the main reason why I went on to achieve what I did achieve. It, it, you know, had it not been for them, I, I wouldn't have achieved that. I mean, Tony and Selby were so special for us all at the club. Um, they were completely dedicated to the club. They were dedicated to us. Um, and they gave us a, a, a sort of love and, and commitment to, to running and, and running for the club. Um, in, in the week after Selby died a few weeks ago, Tim Souter, uh, who's also a, a former old boy, uh, you know, he, he described Selby as talent blind. And, and I think anyone listening today uh, should know that, that Tony and Selby would encourage anyone in the club, regardless of their ability. Um, and obviously, some of us were, were 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 the ones who were, you know, beating the school records. But there were many others who were in the club who were just doing it because they loved it. And Tony and Selby encouraged all of us equally and wanted all of us to give our best, um, you know, in our training, in our races. And I mean, of course, the the great thing about Tony, I think Tony might be listening today, so I better be careful what I say, but Tony would get annoyed if you didn't give of your best. Um, but that was a great attitude to have because it spoke of their their total dedication to the club. And, you know, I suppose it was also what was expected of us. And um, Paul, if you'll let me, I mean, some of my great memories of, uh, of being with friends and um, you know, club members go to those, you know, minibus journeys, you know, back from Midland Public Schools when uh, Tony was not because, you know, one or two of us hadn't given of our best. And, you know, they set a very high standard. But I suppose because of them, the club was special. And I would go as far as to say it was unique. And I think the other thing that I would want to say about the school running club is that at the time when we were competing there probably wasn't a school running club in the country like ours that would go to the northern club championships for example where most of the people taking part were representing running clubs not their school we were representing our school running club and of course we we were doing well but uh, um it just spoke of the fact that Bradford Grammar School as a running club was very, very different from um, most other school running clubs of the time and probably, you know, well, almost certainly any school running club that exists nowadays. Thank you. I understand that. You, you describe a club which has got a, an amazing balance between the right sort of pressure which inspired you to achieve, uh, Tony being a little bit grumpy on the bus back when you hadn't uh, run as hard as you could have, and yet also making it a joy to be part of. Um, but the commitment you're describing from Tony and Sel Selby, who were making that training possible pretty much seven days a week, uh, was was extraordinary. Um, I, I'm interested about the, your, your comment that Selby was talent blind, uh, because I'm very conscious that there are, there are some sports where uh, it is possible to achieve without a huge amount of talent when you come in at the start, simply by grinding away at it and getting better. Was there, were there members of Bradford Grammar School Running Club back then who you remember as being, let's say, non-starters uh, in year seven, but went on to be mainstays of the team by the time they left the school? Um, I mean, obviously, to, to achieve success, um, in, in any sport, in, in running, you've got to have a, a degree of talent. 
So it wasn't as though, um, you, you know, Tony and Selvi were in the business of um, producing high level or even elite athletes. They were they were there to allow us to enjoy our running. And because of the commitment of everyone and, and the enthusiasm, you know, and the amount of training that we did, we were always going to going to do well. Um, I think that there were a lot of people who went uh, through school and went through the, the school running club who did a lot of running at school, but then when they left school and went on to university or went, went elsewhere, didn't do a lot of running in the years immediately following because the club wasn't there and the club meant everything for us um, while we were at school. And, and it might sound strange, but I think when I was 12, 13, 14, I often thought, will I, will I continue my running after I leave school? And that was because the club meant everything to me. I was, I was a team player. I mean, you mentioned that I, I played rugby for the school. I played cricket for the school. I played rugby for Otley Rugby Club. And, and I, I loved being part of a team. And so I loved being part of Graff Grammar School Cross Country Club. And I knew that when I left school, the club wasn't going to be there. And, you know, if I wanted to, con to continue, I'd be continuing. Well, possibly as part of a running club, but it'd be more of an individual pursuit. So um, I, I hope that gives you a sense of, uh, you know, how important the club was um, to us as, as members. And I'm sure that many people listening to, to, to me this evening who were part of the, the club at that time. They, they probably don't need me to explain why it was so special, but um, as, as you weren't part of the club, I can explain to you in, in those words. No, that, that's, that's lovely to hear. I mean, I mean uh, Tony and Selby are, are part of the folklore of Bradford Grammar School, but, but most of us who are still here uh, were not around for the, the time when Bradford Grammar School was that elite club winning everything in schools cross country just about and, and it was important for us to understand uh, how Tony and, and Selby were, de were dealing with things perhaps a few years earlier than the likes of myself Mike McCartney who's now running cross country here um, re remember uh, know about um, in that team that cross country team which was so very successful which you describe as very much a, a group of friends who loved running together um, there was also Andrew Leach and at different times in your school career each of you had the beating of the other one how did you balance being friends and enjoying running together at the same time as being rivals yeah it's funny that uh, I mean uh, Andrew has become a, a very good friend um, and I think I, I would say you know we were very very good friends at the time that we left school as we went through school I mean you're right to say that we were we were rivals uh, we were you know on the team together and we were you know winning um, events for the school together as, as part of the same team but you, you know you, you you push each other on in, in, in a really good way um, I mean, I think it's true to say the under, under 12, under 14 school course record I had, and then Andrew had the under 16 and, and senior uh, record. Uh, and so I suppose that tells you that in, in the first few years, I, w I slightly had the edge over Andrew. And then in the last few years of school, Andrew, you know, had the edge over me. Um, but I think probably what was more important was that um, we were we were pushing each other on. So when we went to the English schools together at Townmore in Newcastle uh, as under 16s, uh, you know, both of us wanted to make the England schools team. Um, as it turned out, you know, Andrew was second. I was I was 16th. Andrew made the team. I didn't, you know, but I mean, it, it meant that, you know, we were I think we were pushing each other on. And, and so, yeah, I mean, that rivalry, um, which was already a friendship at school. It, it, it became an even closer friendship uh, af in the years after school. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, the BGS Cross Country Club was, was everything to you in, in terms of your running time uh, and that you couldn't see past that when you left uh, school. Um, you've described yourself as a, as a late starter 
um, that you sort of, I've mentioned at the start, that you got into the elite running after Oxford and Harvard. W were you also running while you were at university at a competitive level? Um, uh, and uh, or, or was there a gap? No, there's no gap. I, I mean, I, I loved my running and continued my running um, after school. I mean, I, I had six months living in Germany after I left school and, um, you know, I could have stopped running then, but I, I was running uh, every day when I was in Germany and then through through university, um, as you mentioned, you know, I had spells at Oxford and at Harvard. And um, I mean, I, I think it was only a number of circumstances really that made it meant that I, I really achieved the the highest level of the sport international level i mean uh, while i i was at university i was a good student runner but uh you know i wasn't uh, near to national team um i suppose one of the one of the things that happened um well i had a year living in in, in the soviet union as it was in, in 1985, because I was studying uh, German and Russian at, at university, thanks to uh, Courtney Lloyd um, giving me a love for Russian. And um, uh, and I think that changed my attitude to running a little bit, you know, being exposed to a, a more professional system um, midway through my my degree at Oxford. Then, then I, I, I had a, I, I, I met Bruce Tuller, um, who became my coach. And it's quite interesting to reflect on that because um, I could say, you know, Selby and Tony were my coaches, but 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 actually, as we've said, Selby and Tony were the people who gave me a love for the sport, and Bruce really was my first coach who coached me as a as an elite athlete. And um, I think again, it was because of Bruce that I, I achieved the success I did at international level um you know as you said a little bit later than quite a few other athletes and and that is is lovely to hear in itself because you're describing a school club which as you've already said was talent blind everybody was welcome and people were leaving the school with a, a passion for sport which they could then pick up later or not as the, as they see fit so yeah what what, what a special experience um Going back to the, the training side of things for a moment, uh, obviously training for an elite marathon and training for schools races are never going to be the same thing. But but were there aspects of training with Tony and Selby that you recognised that were replicated, repeated perhaps uh, in your regime with Bruce Tuller? Uh, I would say not at all. <laughs> they weren't. Um, in this, um, you know, my, my memories of, of you know, running with Tony and Selby, they they were sort of things that were part of school tradition. So Tuesday lunchtimes, we would do uh, two miles on the track where 50 boys would line up uh, together on the school cinder track and we'd run two miles as fast as we could. And that was a perfect group session. Um, it, it, it suited 50 boys of different ages, aged from 11 to 18, uh, running together, just like we'd run up Gaysby Lane, uh, a group of 50 boys, you know, with, with Tony near the front and Selby at the back. Of course, when you when you start thinking about the sessions that, you know, Bruce was giving me, it was, it was customised training to help um, an individual athlete, you know, get the best out of himself. And, and so I hope that explains to you um, the difference. But, you know, Again, some of my great memories with, with Tony and Selby, you're, you're allowing me to indulge in these, are when we went on camp to um, Horton and Rib Ribblesdale in the October half term. These are the crazy things that we, we would do. And we would run, you know, go for a 20 mile run. Uh, I, I think I did, I did a 19 mile run as a, as a 13 year old. Um, wearing tiger cubs with Tony and you know uh, I don't know seven or eight others I still remember that um, and you know in, in some ways I like to think that that run and that the, the love or the fun that I had doing that possibly you know led on to me becoming a marathon runner you know 15 20 years later and and jumping ahead 
even further. I mean, it's absolutely clear you still love running now. Um, I know your 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 uh, attention is elsewhere with your involvement in Ethiopia with the cycling side as well. Um, but uh, I noticed uh, last year park run in 17 minutes, which um, I think is an achievement we can all relate to. Those of us who staggered around a park run. Um, given that you could have stuck with any sport, and, and I mean after school, I mean after you finished with your your elite level career. Um, what is it about running itself that's captivated you? Well, I think anyone who's a runner doesn't need me to explain, you know, why why running is 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 great. You know, why why people enjoy running. I mean, you you know, you you get a buzz from running. It's not it's nice to be fit, um, I, and it's nice nice to run with others. It, you know, you, you see great parts of of the country, whether it's uh, just outside here where I live in Sussex, or you know, obviously where I've travelled the world. Um, so. Um, of course, if, if you're listening to this and you're, you're not a runner, then um, I, I'm not going to try and defend, you know, why running is, is, is so good. But I mean, it is it is a very portable sport, um, and it is something that you can do, you know, almost anywhere. And again, if you're pressed for time, you can just go out for a 30 minute, 40 minute run, and, and it makes you feel better. Um, I think the reason that I've I have been able to keep a degree of fitness in the last ten years is because um, I've, uh, as you mentioned, you know I've taken up road cycling, um, and that's just allowed me to to keep a fair a fair bit fair bit of fitness, and and so I do a lot less running, but I, I still can enjoy, you know I've got enough fitness that I can enjoy a run when I do a, do go out for a run, and I, mean, and I would run more. Um, but my body doesn't allow me sometimes to run uh, quite as much as I'd like to nowadays. <laughs> I know that feeling. Um, so, <laughs> yes. so going back to your, th that transition that turned you from a, a decent student runner into world record, well, uh, yeah, world record holder, member of national team. You, you mentioned Russia, you mentioned professionalism. We've talked about Bruce Tullow, and I, I think we've also already touched on this idea of training at altitude. You, you were known as a perfectionist. You, you, you were talking about nutrition and, and, and hydration and things like that. Was what were you ahead of your time? I, I, I see that as things that have been talked about in sport relatively recently. Um, was 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 the training that you were doing vastly different to what other people were doing in that time? No, no, it wasn't. No, I mean, I, I think you know, I, I was running, uh, at, you know, when I was coming up through the sport at a time when distance running in Britain was 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 very popular, and we had some great role models. I mean, you know, obviously, I go back to David Bedford, Brendan Foster in the early seventies, and then. Co uh, and Ovet and, and Cram and Peter Elliott through the through the 19, 1980s. So we had great role models, and there were lots of people like me who were trying to you know do well in running, and you know were, were dreaming of, of running for Britain. And I would say you know more more then than than now because of the success that you know those those great athletes had. Um, um, Sorry, your question was, was it. It was really just what what had um, what had made the difference. How how yeah, I mean, that sorry, professionalism. How how yeah, did it come I, to you? I, I, I mean, I I think I I when I got to the end of of my studies, um, Bruce was coaching me, and he provided a perfect environment for for me at Marlborough College, where I, I I was a part time school teacher because. He arranged the job for me to really pursue my running dreams and I think I was very fortunate um, in that um, when I finished at Oxford or after my two years at, at Harvard I could have become a graduate trainee with Unilever or with Shell or you know if you like followed a more conventional route for an Oxford graduate um, but um, I I'd started to see that I had I had the uh, chance, if you like, to to get to international level, and then, you know, Bruce provided that environment for me, and and, and then when it was given to me, I, I said, right, well, I'm not going to waste this chance. I'm I'm going to give give it the best shot I I, I could, and I suppose, um, you know, I, I suppose you know both my, my mother and father they brought me up to say you know, work hard, play hard, and, 
you know, if you're going to do something, then then do it to the best of your ability. I mean, I think that was uh, a sort of repeated fam family motto. Um, and 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 so you know, when I was in my mid twenties and I was given that chance, then I, I was going to try and try my best in all those aspects that you were talking about then it you know it wasn't just you know you tr train as hard as you could but you you try and you know get the best support team around you now in the late 80s early 90s um you know british sport was in a very different place to where it is now where you know with lottery funding that there is a lot more support that is given to athletes and so uh with bruce's help um i had to if you like build that support team uh, myself rather than have people you know inviting me on training camps uh, to, to go to altitude or you know together we had to seek out physiologists we had to you know f you know find all, all the best ways that I could prepare for for my races but I enjoyed that and I I'd also want to add that you know Bruce came from a scientific background so you know he he wanted to explore a lot of those things that that helped made you know make me as good as i was but it i it wasn't it wasn't exceptional i think there were other people like me uh, and there were other people who were yeah probably even more talented you know the the crowns of this world who who i i, I raced while i was a schoolboy you know who went on to achieve you know much more success than i did um, you, you have always been very quick to credit the team you work with for your athletic successes. You, you've started mentioning them there. I've, and we've also already established that there's a, a well, a gulf between training for schools level activities and, and uh, you know, running at schools level and going on to elite level. Um, I've got a quote from you here. I, I, I couldn't have done what I did without a good team around me, starting with my coach and adding a number of others who helped in many different ways. Um, you've mentioned training at altitude uh, in preparation for marathons. Really for the BGS students who are listening, and, I, and, and as you probably know, we've got an exceptionally talented uh, junior cross country team coming through at the moment. Um, could you tell us about how you went about preparing for your marathon races? Let, let's let's take the the, um, the World Cup ra race in 1993. What what what? What was your preparation camp? How did it work? So, so when I started running marathons, I um, I, I sort of used a, a twelve-week build-up. So, I, uh, at that at that stage in my career, I, I tended to run two marathons a year. Um, so, if you like, half of the year, twenty-four weeks approximately, I was in very focused uh, marathon preparation training. And then the other half of the year, I, I would be doing other training. So obviously not quite as many miles. Maybe I was preparing for cross country or, or track races. So in, in the 12 weeks that I was uh, preparing for the World Cup Marathon in um, September and October 1993, I went away to train at altitude. I think you referred to that. And I, I mean, one of the reasons why I regularly went away to altitude wasn't just because of the altitude, the physiological benefits of, of, of being at altitude, but also because you're in a training camp situation. When you're in a training camp situation, what do you do? You run, you eat, you sleep, and you do that. Um, you repeat it either once or twice in a day. You know, there are times in training camps when I'd be training three times a day, other times I'd be tra training twice a day, but, it, but basically that's what you're there to do. So um, that wasn't the entire 12 week period, but, um, you know, you would, uh, I, I would be training, you know, hard sometimes, you know, at home, um, maybe two weeks hard, one week easy, two weeks hard, one week easy, three weeks training camp, uh, come back, ease up, have, have a final race two weeks out from the race and then start your taper um, into into the, the marathon. And, you know, that was, that was the physical side of the training. And then there were other aspects, you know, I, I suppose, three months before the World Cup Marathon in San Sebastian, I'd been out to San Sebastian to run to run on the on the course so that I knew, you know, what I was preparing for, for when I went out to race at race weekend. No, thank you. I'm sure. I, sorry, Paul. I, I mean, I, I, I could go on, but I mean, I, I hope I give you a sense of, you know, you, you, you're just very focused, I, I think, as an elite athlete. It's a very 
singular uh, focused um, lifestyle and approach that you've got to take. And, uh, and, and and you've also referred to the, the people that are around you who are helping you get the best out of yourself, whether it's your coach or your physio, your master nutritionist um, or other people who are there to help. And I'm, I'm sure our young athletes, some of whom might be considering, you know, could it be me one day? Uh, would love to hear about the team that, that, that you had around you. Um, although I'm not so sure they'll be so so pleased that, that well, the prospect of having to go out and find the right people for themselves. As you say, it's, sport's very different nowadays and all these people um, are, are, are laid on for for, for people to um, to take advantage of. So, so yeah, no, thank you. Really interesting. Um, of, of course, af after your successes uh, in athletics, um, you, you moved on to a life beyond athletics. Um, I, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what it was like finishing as an elite le level athlete and, and did you have to do a much sort of training down or something or, did, or, or was there a transition period or, or did it feel fairly natural? Well, I listened to the conversation that you had with Adrian Morehouse um, a couple of months ago and I remember Adrian saying it, it was hard for him and, and I think for, for a lot of um, elite athletes finishing, you know, retiring, I suppose, uh, as a elite uh, athlete or sports person, it, it, it can be very difficult. And I really do understand that. I was very, very fortunate um, in that I had, um, a, a, I'd say an easy transition, but the, the reason for that was, was uh, let me explain what, what happened was that, um, in, in 1996, I went to the Olympics. That was my second Olympics. Uh, in 1996, I, I also got married to, to Gail. And um, I suppose we, we, we made a kind of agreement that I would ca carry on up until the third, uh, you know, what I hoped would be my third Olympics in Sydney. And then we would draw the line there. I mean, I knew that if I made it to Sydney, I, I would have been 36 years old and that would have been, you know, I would have had... A, 11, 12 years of being an international athlete. So I suppose um, in the end, I didn't make it to Sydney because of an injury, but in the 12 months leading up to uh, Sydney, when I, I knew I was going to, to, to call it a day, we started making preparations for uh, moving out to Africa. Um, in the end, you know, we went to live in, in Ethiopia. And um, the reason we, we decided to go and, and live in Ethiopia was that from, 1989 to 1998, every year, um, I had spent the Christmas winter period training in, in Kenya. Um, alongside that, Gail, as, as a doctor, had, had done a lot of uh, her, her work as a junior doctor and, and training in different African countries, and she was heading in the direction of, of global health. So we we were keen to go and live in, in Africa and something opened up for us in Ethiopia. When we went out to Ethiopia in 2001, we just started a family. So we went out with a four month old daughter <laughs> and I immediately became an event organizer. But I think what made it easy or easier was that I, it, I was starting a very new chapter in my life and the people around me that I, I started working with in, in Ethiopia, um, very few of them thought of me as an athlete or knew that I had uh, an athletic career. I mean, there were one or two people like Haile Gebrselassie and one or two of the, the top Ethiopian athletes who were helping us, uh, who, who knew of my past. But in, in terms of the event, uh, you know, race organising, um, I, you know, I could just, if you like, recreate myself and, and in terms of put, put, my, put my energies into something that was a completely new challenge for me. And of course, we were, you know, both of us with, with, with our baby daughter in a very new environment. And so it just felt like we were starting a very new phase of our lives. And, and that was, was easy, you know, if you like, to, if you like, put behind me the, um, the competitive side of, of what I'd been doing um, in the UK. And, and that takes us very nicely on to um, the, the Great Ethiopian Run. Um, how did that come about um, and, and what was your role in making it happen for the first time? Yeah, so I mean, 
In a way, I mean, everyone knows, I think, that Ethiopia is, is you know, has been for the last 50 years a distance running nation. You know, it's, it's, it's had so much success at the highest level of the sport. But when we moved out there in, in 2001, it still really didn't have its own London Marathon, its, its own big international mass participation event. Um, we moved out to, to Addis Ababa about, um, I think it was about eight months after the Sydney Olympics, where Ethiopia had been very, very successful, won eight Olympic medals, four gold medals, all in distance running events. And of course, we, we're at the period when Haile Gebe Selassie was, you know, hugely uh, popular, hugely well known around the world. And there was this idea um, to, to stage a big international race in Addis Ababa. It wasn't my idea. It came in part, I think, from conversations that had been happening in Addis Ababa in the British Embassy. Um, and it, I think also there was a conversation between Brendan Foster, who, who Great North Run, uh, and, and Hiley when they were in Sydney. But what it needed was somebody really to take that idea forward. You can have, uh, you know, plans to do something. Um, and um, it was almost coincidental, really, that I arrived in, um, in, in May 2001 uh, and then took on the role of being the, the local coordinator as a completely novice um, event organiser. I hadn't organised a race in my life, but somebody <laughs> needed to be, to be there to take the project forward. And I mean, I have to say, it, it, it was very difficult to pull it off. And the reason for that is that uh, Ethiopia 20 years ago was a very different place from the Ethiopia of today. Ethiopia today is a very can-do place. Ethiopia of 20 years ago was just 10 years on from the end of the, the, the communist Derg regime. And all the people in, in positions of uh, authority were people whose priority was, was not to do the wrong thing. That makes sense. Yes. Um, and so, um, what I was trying to do, it, it was with the help of others like the British ambassador, like you know, Haile Gebrselassie, who was right, my right hand person at the time, was to to create something new in something what in something, in other words, in athletics that was a national asset for Ethiopia. So it was a big challenge, and it took. It took the best part of five years for, if you like, the, the government and the authorities to really give recognition to what we were doing. Because now, we're talking 19 years on from the first event, the Great Ethiopian Run has become hugely popular and um, it, it's, it's lovely to look back. Um, and uh, but but you know there are a small number of us who were involved from the beginning who you know can remember how hard it was just to, just to get things off the ground um but it, it's it's wonderful to see you know what the event now means to to the people of ethiopia uh, and and also how the event has been if you like taken forwards uh, in in the years since uh, we left the country you know i passed it on to to colleagues who, who've, who've made the event much bigger and uh, even more popular than it was 10 years ago. Oh, that's fabulous. Um, and with these massive international events, when, when countries get them, we, we talk more and more about legacy, don't we? You know, the legacy of the London Olympics and so on. What, what's has what's the knock-on of the great Ethio Ethiopian run been for Ethiopia the nation? Has it spawned a whole load of other similar events or, or, or increased that can-do attitude that you were talking about a moment ago? Well, well, well you know, the, the, as an organisation, Great Ethiopian Run does a whole series of mass participation races around the country, you know, if you like, more community runs. And Great Ethiopian Run has become um, the premier event management company in, in Ethiopia. And, I, and I'm, I am proud to say that because event management, even as a concept, um, was, was an alien concept 20 years ago. Uh, but as I say, Ethiopia now, um, its economy and its whole attitude to business has moved on hugely in, in, in those 20 years. So, so you know, that now is, is very different. But, but I, I think what I would say, and, and again, any, anyone who's taken part in the Great Ethiopian Run, there are a number of uh, 
British uh, runners who come out and do it, is that it's a celebration of, of what is so special about uh, Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopians, they, they love coming together to celebrate. They often come together to celebrate religious festivals or national holidays, like they will do on Fridays, the Ethiopian New Year on Friday. I mean, that, they've, they've been doing that for centuries, coming together. But of course, the Great Ethiopian Run brings people together. I mean, we're talking 40,000, they, they come together. The other thing that Ethiopians love that, that many people don't know is that they love music and they love dancing. And the Great Ethiopian Run is hardly a run, it's a street party. And so again, uh, anyone who has taken part in the run will know that it's, it's just a street party on the move. Um, and of course, the other thing that it does is it brings together music with dancing, with uh, people coming together, with running, which is what Ethiopia is known for. So it's also, you know, been great for Ethiopia's image. Um, and, and all of those things, I think, um, are, are why the event is so important for the country. Yes, of course. And, and um, despite everything, I, 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 I confess when, when you said that it was only 10 years since communist rule, and of course, but Ethiopia has had so many problems that have been uh, in the news over the years, uh, getting those good news stories out about such a beautiful country uh, is, is extraordinarily important. And when I say such a beautiful country, I'm actually not speaking from experience there. I wish I was. I've, I've seen your Twitter feed, which seems to be roughly a 50-50 split between things related to running and uh, your cycling holidays uh, business and, and the, the cycling in Ethiopia. Uh, so you've changed direction again. You already mentioned that you, you're now running a, the, the Ethio cycling holidays. Um, how did you find starting out in business from scratch? by comparison to starting out as an event organiser from scratch, straight out of running? Um, I mean, in a way, Paul, you know, setting up the Great Ethiopian Run and setting up Ethio cycling holidays, they're, they're similar, they're, they're, they're small businesses. And uh, they're also similar in that uh, with Great Ethiopian Run, a lot of my focus was on building up a team, a local team who could work with me but also take the work forward and, and the same is true in a way of Ethio cycling holidays that the team that I'm working with are, are all in Ethiopia in the, in the northern region which is where cycling is is really you know very much part of the culture road cycling is part of the culture and 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 so that there are similarities there in, in terms of uh, you know building up a team uh, and, and then trying to sell a product uh, the other similarity um, is that we would not have achieved the success with Great Ethiopian Run had it not been for Haile Gebri Selassie, who everyone knows as, a, as you know, one of the world's most successful long distance runners of all time. Similarly, with cycling, um, just in the last few years, Ethiopia has produced a, a, a world class cyclist, this Garbu Girme, who's riding for Michelton Scott and he rides Tour de France. and, and and so, you know, he is our, our ambassador and our, the face of Ethio Cycling Holidays. And uh, again, uh, you know, I, I think our, our conversation today has, has uh, shown you how much I believe in the power of role models. And uh, he, he is our role model. And, and I mean, the, the message that we want to send out to international tourists, not only that Ethiopia is open for tourism, but that um, cycling is also a really, really big sport in Ethiopia. It has been for 50 years. Most people won't know that. It's been, you know, since the time that the Italians would come and race on the streets of Addis Ababa um, 70 years ago. So, um, yeah, that's, again, people will experience that if they come out to Ethiopia. By the way, thanks for allowing me to give, give, give the listeners a plug for uh, Ethiopia for some road cycling. It is an amazing place to ride a bike if you if you want a bit of a challenge. I'd, I'd, I'd love that. Yes, I, 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 I tell you what, I had a look at those pictures and thought, wouldn't mind. Um, and, and as well as starting your own business and organising the Great Ethiopian Run at the outset, um, you've also <laughs> you're also in print, uh, author of a book, Marathon Running from Beginning to Elite. Um, 
and, and at the same time sing backing vocals in an Isley Brothers tribute band. Uh, I'm just wondering, out of all of these talents that are sort of on the fringe, if you like, uh, the, the things that you do just for fun and not be not be not because they have become uh, your, your life the way running has or, or the way your cycling business now has, which which of these are your uh, are your favourites? And and tell me a bit about the pleasure you get out of them, the the authoring and the the singing and the music. Uh, I, I, I guess I ought to just uh, correct you that the, the Wikipedia information you have about the singing, I think that just reveals that people are allowed to write on Wikipedia things that are not true. <laughs> Sorry, um, I thought that. So that's all right. That, that's, that's, that's fine. The, um, the reference to my authoring is, is completely true. I have written a book and uh, the, the reason I wrote the book was really because I I just wanted to put down on paper, you know, some of the amazing experiences I'd had as a as a distance runner competing at international level. Um, but of course, to to write a book and to make it sell, your your publisher will say, well, Richard, you've got to write about a little bit more than just what it's like at international level. So it, it turned into a, a manual f f for marathon running. Um, I mean, yes. Yeah, so so you know. I, you ask me what's my what's my first love well i mean i suppose i i would s go back to where we started the conversation i mean um running running and cycling i mean uh, i will, will never will never be apart apart from me um you know and it, a, a day without a run or, or or a bike ride is still a slightly unusual day for for me um so that's what i i love doing um but um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, life moves up, moves on, and um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I suppose because of the ten years that we spent in Ethiopia, I, I am interested in, you know, taking forward, if you like, the, the business projects that we've all also talked about, because I, th I think that will help in in Ethiopia's development. Um, and I suppose the other thing we haven't quite yet touched on is that I'm I, I'm a father of, of two teenage children and, um, you know, still want to encourage them in their studies uh, and also in their sports. So, you know, that still occupies a fair bit of my time. Well, yeah, let's let's talk about that for a moment, because that would be very interesting. You you were in uh, Ethiopia from, if I've got it right, 2001 to 2010, and um, your your daughter was was a, a baby when you went out there. What what was it like bringing out bring bringing a well? I mean, I, I don't know how familiar Ethiopia was to you as a place to live, as opposed to somewhere to train, because I imagine training camps could have been sort of relatively isolated from the everyday life of the country. I don't know. I, I guess that's a question in itself. But what was it like bringing up a young child uh, in Ethiopia in those days? Paul, it was the best place to bring up, bring up a child. I mean, as I mentioned, she was, uh, Almaz was, was four months old when we went out there. And the people in Ethiopia, they just love babies. They love young children. So when you go, when Gail and I went to a restaurant with a six-month-old baby, the baby would be taken out of our hands and we would just enjoy a meal together and you know an hour or two later they'd bring the baby back and you just knew it was a very very different environment to you know an environment in, in the western world certainly today you just felt that, that your you know your children growing up were, were, were completely safe uh, and so you know so well looked after and um, we, we we had nannies um, and of course, in, in saying that, it probably sounds rather decadent, but it is, you know, having nannies and having guards um, it is just is very much part of the culture. So even if I say our nanny had a nanny, that, <laughs> it, that, that explain is very much part of the culture that you're, you're giving employment to people. Um, and, and so I, I suppose it was you know, one of the best places to bring up uh, two small children. And uh, so I, I think we, you know, Gail and I feel very fortunate that we were able to do that. In, in many ways, it, you know, it wasn't something we planned. Um, and although I, I said that, you know, both Gail and I had, had been in, in many African countries 
before we went out to Ethiopia. When we actually moved out to Ethiopia in 2001, it was a new country for both of us. So all my training camps had been in Kenya and South Africa, and all Gail's medical work had been in other African countries, not Ethiopia. So I think we feel very fortunate that we, you know, if you like, landed in Ethiopia and, um, you know, found that that, that was the case in, in terms of uh, it was a great place uh, for us to bring up children. Of course, that's not true of, of every place in Africa. I think we were also lucky that uh, living at altitude um, made it a lot easier. We, we were in a, a very, very nice climate, uh, you know, where there was a lot of sunshine, there was a lot of outdoor living, um, but, um, you know, you could sleep um, in the cool at, at night time, which is also important. <laughs> um, I, I think th this is a point where I probably need to apologise to, any, to, to anybody who's listening to this. I, I meant to have on my screen a list of um, comments and questions from, from other people. Uh, and for some reason, it's, it's I, I can't see that section of, of my screen where I meant to see them. So I think with a little fault at this end. If, if you've sent a question through for Richard and I haven't read it out or sent a comment for him, I'm really sorry. Um, yeah. Hopefully it'll work better next time. Um, a little while ago, you, you said we were going sort of full circle and back to school. And, and actually that was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, we're, we're running a little bit short of time now. Uh, as you'd imagine, I, 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 I tried to do a little bit of digging uh, and I asked uh, Mike McCartney, who, as I've said already, is running the cross country team uh, nowadays, uh, to, to feed me a few lines if he possibly could. And he got in touch with Andy Smith. Uh, who you'll remember was the geography teacher, head of geology, uh, and also first team cricket coach uh, back in the day. Um, and, and this is uh, and what Andy Smith sent back. Um, Richard only played first 11 in 1982, eight matches as a fairly correct but limited opening bat. 111 runs at 13.88, top score. You'll recognise Andy Smith in these statistics. 33 and a winning draw against MGS. Here we go with the good bit. Played a lot for the seconds between 1980 and 82, which pleased Tony Kingham. Used to open with Ashley Metcalf lower down the school and ran him out in the Lord's Taverners national quarterfinal at Lancaster. He was distraught. The only real claim to fame or ignominy on the cricket field. Um, that's Andy Smith's uh, recollection of your um, your cricket career in school. Um, that is amazing. I don't know <laughs> how he can remember that, or uh, he must have kept such detailed notes. But I do remember the run out. Yes. Yeah. No, as you'll say, uh, uh, Andy Smith keeps very detailed notes. Um, the, the reason I mention that actually isn't just to embarrass you. It, it's it's more because you were in what was an amazing year group, I think, even by BGS standards. You had, in, in the same year group as you, you had Adrian Morehouse, the swimmer, and Ashley Metcalf, of course, we've already mentioned. Were, were you, as a, as a group, aware that you had a, a special, that you were a special group of people um, with, with particular talents, or, or was that just part of your everyday reality and you took it for granted? I mean, it's the, the latter, very much the latter. I mean, sorry, Paul, you didn't mention Jason Georgiou who was another he was a rugby star who I, th I think went on to play for um, for Yorkshire. And of course, uh, another person who, who I grew up with was Nigel Melville, not through BGS, um, former England scrum half. Um, uh, he was in, in, in the scouts in Menston. Um, so, so it was just, it was very, very normal. And I mean, I, I think that the, the reality is that when you're at school, um, everything around you is the normal. Uh, it's only when you leave school and you reflect on what you've experienced as a, as a student at school that you start to realise that how special it was. And uh, yes, I mean, you're right to say that, um, yeah, I mean, it, I, I love to think of uh, opening batting with, with Ashley Metcalf. I mean, um, you know, I, I didn't just do cross country running at school. Um, and um, I, I mean, I, I, I was I wasn't a great cricketer, but I, I love cricket. And, you know, I, I played at school. I played uh, in the Wharfdale League for Menston and, and those those are great memories. But at the time, it was it was just normal. And I think, you know, I was at, at, at BGS for, for 10 years, three years in, in the prep school and then seven years in the secondary school. And of course, it, it felt that that was the it was normal, but but of course it's it's only after you you leave school you look back and you realise, you know how special it was. It was partly special because of you know some of those 
you know, the Morehouse and the Metcalf and the Georgius. It was, but also it was special because of the teachers, you know, the, the Courtney Lloyds and the Mike Skeltons and the Tony Lums who, you know, helped me in, in my studies. Um, but it was also special because, you know, going back to their work hard, play hard. I mean, BTS was, that's what it was, wasn't it? It was, you just did it. That was, that was, uh, a lot of people did it. I mean, I'm not saying that everyone thrived on it, but a lot of people who went to BGS in the 70s and 80s when we were at school were doing exactly the same as, as what, what I was doing, really. You work hard, play hard, and, you know, it was setting you up for what was, what was to come after. That, yeah, and, and, and in a way, uh, having been conscious of, uh, that we are running a little bit of shorter, shorter time, that, that is possibly the very best place to, to start thinking about wrapping this up, Richard. Um, I, I think that the BGS you experienced was clearly a very different place to BGS as it is now. I mean, we're co-educational for starters, but obviously we've had we've, the, the place that you grew up in wouldn't fit into society as it is now. So we, we have sort of modernized an awful lot over the years, uh, in, in, but both in terms of the buildings and of course socially. Um, it, but at, the, at its root, BGS is the same place that you were a member of, uh, in that it's all about getting a group of talented young people together and helping them to make the very best of what they've got. And and you as somebody with, with such huge and varied talents, you know, linguist, international athlete, and so on and so on, we've been talking about it for the last hour, have, have clearly made the very best of all of those talents that, that you were given. What advice would you give to our kids now that you know looking back on your life how, how can they make the best of what they've got well i mean i think it is true to say that that bgs and and, and the world is you know it's a very different place you know to, to how it was in the in the 70s and 80s when, when we were at school um but I, I mean i think what i would say to any student at bgs is that it, you know, make, make the most of your opportunities because I know that BGS is still a great place. You know, I've had some really nice conversations with, with, with Simon um, in, in recent months just to come up to date really with a little bit what's happening at the school. And, and I just, um, I get a sense still that to, to be a student at, at BGS is, it gives uh, young youngsters, young men and young women great opportunities it's a great foundation for them um, just so I, I'm sure that some of the opportunities that are being offered to them are, are very different to the opportunities that that, that that we were given but but fundamentally I am sure that it's similar in that it's if, if people throw themselves into all that the school is offering them and uh, you know give of their best then uh, you know that they will have not not only will they have good futures, but they will be able to help others, um, because I'm sure that that is still very much part, probably even more so, you know, part of what the school is is trying to do and trying to create um, in 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 the broader educational sense now. Thank you very much for that, and I'm I'm sure our, our youngsters who are tuned in will will uh, well I hope they'll take those wise words on board. Um, Thank you so much for, for talking to me uh, this evening, Richard. It's, it's been an, an honour and, and a pleasure talking to you. Uh, you've, you've had some fascinating things to say, which I'm, I hope that those people who are tuned in have, have enjoyed hearing. Um, I, I guess some of, our, some of our audience will have been uh, people who are contemporaries of yours at school and others are young people now, like that junior cross country team who I mentioned to you before, who are going to go on to, to, to great things. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for, for chatting to me and can I wish you the very best of success with um, Ethio cycling holidays uh, and I hope we'll see you in school sometime soon. Yeah, thanks Paul. Thanks for letting me indulge in, in those memories. It's been really nice talking to you. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks.